Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. John, where a slight sprinkling of snow welcomed us this morning. Uh, It's toasty in here, though, and I am glad to see you all. My name is Beth Voigt. I am the pastor here at St. John. I will first point out, you may be looking at the order of service and say, where's communion? Well, we will be having communion. It's just as we sort of vary between weekends. Sometimes things go don't get changed. Um, so we will be having communion today. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. And following the service, immediately we will have our annual meeting. So um, if you haven't signed in on the congregational meeting book, that's in the back of the sanctuary, in the narthex, actually. Um, please do that before the meeting starts. That's how we, we keep track of who's here for that meeting. Because believe it or not, some people may come that don't come to worship. You know, Maybe they were here last night. But as well, I encourage you, because we just want you to write your name everywhere, to use the welcome books that are in the pews, pass them down, pass them around. That's another way that not only do we know you were here, but that you can communicate with the office staff, with me. Um, So that's important too. So as we go through the announcements, you can pass them around. And then um, if you remember, it's okay if you don't, someone will rip the sheet off and put it in the offering plate that's then um, tabulated by the office. A few other announcements. Of course, you saw all the ones that were on the screens, but I will highlight that this week, on Thursday night, we will have a Culver's Share Night. Um, That is the combined effort of the youth ministries in a variety of our Reedsburg churches, um, and Youth Connection is what we call it. They will be having a fundraising night, so um, I would say don't plan on cooking Go to Culver's on Thursday, November 18th, um, and help support our youth groups. They do all kinds of things together, including retreats, and it's a a great thing. In a few moments, we'll bless our shoeboxes. We will be sending those off, and so, of course, we want to to offer a blessing for them. Many thanks to those who who gave and filled a box, uh, and, and that will go to bring cheer to someone far away. A little bit closer to home, our mitten tree. If you haven't had a chance to take a mitten, that as well will bring a little extra something needed for a young person um, and, again, bring joy to a family. So take a mitten and note the date when those are due back. It's all in the inside of your order, your bulletin, so to speak. Um, So the final thing I'll point out are pies So um, I think we have 19 pies available, and you sign up for the pie you want. That sheet is on the Welcome Center ledge. Again, as you leave the uh, the sanctuary to your left, where it says welcome, um, sign up for a pie for Thanksgiving. That's going to be super yummy, so I encourage you to do that too. The flowers are here placed because on Friday we had the funeral service for Fritz Cunningham, and Sandy said, Please place some flowers in the sanctuary. Many thanks to all of you who helped with the lunch, the meal, um, and who were here at the service. It means so much to the family. So that's the way we support them. And as well, I wish to ask for prayers for Norma Peters, who um, I found out, her son called me this week, had a stroke while visiting in Colorado. She is still there uh, receiving treatment and rehab, um, but it was, it was pretty scary and continues to be concerning as she works toward, um, toward wellness and recovery. So prayers for Norma for sure. Cinderella. I'm not going to forget that. If you haven't gone, you have to, and there's only one more chance. Go this afternoon, 2 o'clock. I think tickets will be available. You could buy them at the door. It's incredible performance by our young people, our high school students, and our musical department, and members of the community. So that's a great thing. And just a, a shameless plug for the community choir. On the Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend, the community choir will have its It's a cantata at the Cal Center at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, You may not know, but the community choir practices here Sunday nights 
uh, and again, it's the combined effort of so many people in the community. So you'll want to start the holiday season that way. That's enough of my talking about those kinds of things. Join me as we uh, look at these gifts that we will send, the gifts of our heart. Many thanks to the Benish family who organizes this every year. Um, it is outreach. It is an extension of our love for people who are far, far away but close to us in our generosity. And so let us offer a prayer if you'll join me. God, as these boxes fly their way to someone who will love them, we send our love inside. Inside are things that are practical and some that are just fun. But most of all, they say to someone, you are thought of, your name is known, and you are loved by us. And so on their travels, keep them safe. And as they arrive and are opened, may our generosity pour forth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to encourage you to rise in body or in spirit and join your voices for our call to worship. We are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to know and proclaim Jesus Christ and as disciples reach out in love. Let us worship the Lord. We come together for confession as we confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Join me for the confession. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have built walls instead of tables and have turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you send, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from our ways to your ways and free us to serve those in need. Amen. The God who makes all things new forgives your sins for Jesus' sake and remembers them no more. Lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Now Thank We All Our God. It's 840 in the hymnal, or the words will be on the screen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It's time for the special music.
now with the morning readings. A reading from Daniel, the 12th chapter. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish, such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Let us read Psalm 16 responsively. Protect me, O Lord, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my God, my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Eyes for the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I ask a blessing upon these words, upon the hearing, the doing. May they take root. May they grow in us. So you know that on some Sundays during the month, the first and the third, I 
am in worship with all of you, and then I, I very carefully, obeying all laws, drive to Mauston, and I am with a, a small Presbyterian church. They are indeed small. They have maybe 40 members. And as small congregations know, um, sometimes, in fact, when you are small, you do lots of things among the membership that maybe we have a staff to do. And so in their case, there are some Sundays uh, that they lead their own worship service. They do the preaching and the teaching and all the rest. As well, they take care of their building and the grounds. And they rotate that. They have a sign-up sheet. And a different member is responsible for cleaning and caring on any given month. Now, uh, a blessing to them this year, they have two young people as confirmands, both eighth graders, and one of them said, I, I will take care of the church during the summer. And so he did. He did a great job. And I asked him just a couple weeks ago, I said, well, how was that? What was that like to take care of this building? Was it difficult? He said, no. He said, but... But I learned all the secrets. He said, I opened all the doors. I looked under the tables. He said, I can tell you every crack in the stucco on the outside. He knew that place. He uncovered the things that maybe just going on a Sunday you wouldn't know. And he felt an incredible pride uh, in doing that, an investment. That can happen sometimes when things are uncovered and we know more. Well, we also know sometimes when we pull back the cover, things that we wish not to see are visible, aren't they? Here in this church, I could joke about the bats, but I won't because that's no joking matter. But in all seriousness, beyond bats, sometimes when things are revealed, They are not the things we wish we knew. The Gospel of Mark today describes a scene, doesn't it? It describes, if you didn't know, Jesus at the temple. In the very beginning, Jesus is standing in the temple courtyard with his disciples. And what has preceded this gathering is... He has asked them to notice a widow who is surrendering her last two coins to the temple treasury. They don't notice the widow. Instead, they have been dazzled by the architectural majesty surrounding them, so dazzled, but one of the disciples asks Jesus, to notice something in return. Jesus says, look at this widow, and the disciple says, teacher, large stones, large buildings. According to the first century historian Josephus, the Jerusalem temple of Jesus' day was, in fact, awe-inspiring. It was newly constructed, reconstructed, it's the second temple, by Herod the Great. And the retaining walls were composed of stones that were 40 feet long. The temple itself occupied a platform, a footprint, twice as large as the Roman Forum. That's pretty big. And four times as large as the Athenian Acropolis. Even bigger. Herod reportedly used so much gold to cover the outside walls, that anyone who gazed at them in bright sunlight, well, risked blinding oneself. Accordingly, the disciple in the story is impressed and shares his sense of awe with Jesus. Jesus, however, is not dazzled. Instead, he responds to the disciple's remark with a question. Do you see these great buildings? Now, now, why does Jesus ask the disciple if he can see what the, the disciple has just invited Jesus to see? Aren't the two of them looking at, at the same thing? 
Well, well, maybe not. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not seeing the same thing at all. What the disciple sees is an architectural marvel, yes, but also the biggest, boldest, most unshakable symbol of God's presence he's capable of imagining. For him, those massive stones, they hold religious memory. They bolster an occupied people, their identity. They offer a a faithful and potent symbol of glory and pride and worthiness. In short, what takes the disciples' breath away as he gazes at the temple is the religious certainty and permanence, the glittering stones displayed to the whole world. Our people are here. That's what the disciple sees. But what does Jesus see? He sees ruins, rubble, destruction, fragility, not permanence, loss, not glory, change, not stasis. Not one stone will be left here upon another, Jesus tells the stunned disciple. All will be thrown down. This passage from Mark's gospel is often described as apocalyptic. And if you're like me, your cultural reference for apocalypse probably includes maybe a Marvel superhero, maybe the movies that show the end of the world, maybe if you recall the Left Behind series, maybe even a book other in our Bible, the book of Revelation. When I hear the word apocalypse, I think interplanetary warfare, the four horsemen, Vacant-eyed zombies lurching through neighborhoods and wholesale nuclear destruction of the planet. Kind of sounds like things we hear in this day, doesn't it? But, in fact, apocalypse means, means something quite different. An apocalypse is an unveiling, an uncovering, an opening of the door of the cabinet, if you will, a disclosure of something secret and hidden. To experience an apocalypse is to experience fresh sight, honest disclosure, accurate revelation. It is to apprehend reality as we've never apprehended it before. Now, in this sense, when Jesus offers his disciple a a vision, an apocalyptic vision... He invites that disciple to look beyond the grandeur of the temple and recognize that that God cannot be contained even in huge slabs of stone. God cannot be domesticated. The temple is not the epicenter of the saving work of God. God exceeds every edifice, every institution, every mission, every strategic plan, every symbol human beings create in God's name. Moreover, God God is not bound by superlatives. We, We are the ones easily impressed by the biggest, the newest, the shiniest. The disciple says, teacher, what large stones, what large buildings. In her sermon collection, God in Pain, Barbara Brown argues that disillusionment is essential to the Christian life, which seems a head-scratcher to me at first, disillusionment. She writes, disillusionment is literally the loss of an illusion about ourselves, about the world, about God. While it is almost always a painful thing, it is never a bad thing to lose what we may have mistaken for the truth. And so, as as I envision myself in the disciples' place, listening in bewilderment as Jesus pops all the spiritual bubbles, 
Here are some of the questions I'm asking. What lies and illusions do I mistake for truth? And what memories, traditions, or comfort zones do, do I attempt to house God? Well, what shiny religious edifice do I pin my hopes instead of trusting Jesus? Is it my denomination, my church, my spiritual heritage? Why do I cling to permanence when, when Jesus invites me to evolve? Am I willing to sit with the fact that things will fall apart? Things I love, things I built, things I cried and prayed and strived for. Can I embrace a journey of faith that includes rubble, ruin, and failure? The mystic Meister Eichhardt writes, let us pray to God that we may be free of God, implying that our conceptions of God and faith always fall short. Let us name honestly, he suggests, the imposter gods we conjure because we fear the mystery who really is. We shape gods in our own image, and they serve us much as we serve them. In other words, let's endure apocalypse so that truth will be set free and set us free. Dare to see what Jesus sees. Things are getting uncovered. We hold each other tight as we pull back the veil. That's so true of, of our churches in this day, when the things we trusted and the ways we did are no longer what we can do or trust. In the second part of the gospel story, Jesus teaches his disciples what to do and how to live when the walls come tumbling down. Contrary to what our hysteria hungry, if it bleeds, it leads, culture so often encourages, Jesus insists on calm, on generous love in the face of the apocalyptic. Don't be alarmed, he says, when the truth is shaken and nations make war. Don't give in to terror. Don't despair. Don't capitalize on chaos. Those imposters preaching alluring gospels of fear, resentment, and hatred, they are not me. God is not where people often say God is. God doesn't fear monger. God doesn't incite suspicion. God doesn't thrive on human dread. So we must avoid. Avoid hasty, knee-jerk judgments. We must be perceptive. Maybe not so pious, imaginative, yes. We must make peace, choose hope, cultivate patience, and incarnate love as the world reels and changes, and it has. This is the challenge of the gospel. Not simply to bear the apocalypse, but to bear it well. To bear it with the radical, self-sacrificial love Jesus models on the cross. Now, this has been, boy, over a year of emotional and spiritual exhaustion. And we don't have to look further than the news or what's going on in our own lives. That's scarier than any zombie movie. It's easy to despair or grow numb or let exhaustion win. But now... When the world around us feels like it is failing and crumbling, we respond with healing love. What's happening, Jesus promises at the end of this week's gospel reading, is not death. It may feel like it, but it's not. It's birth. Something struggling to be born, and that can hurt. But God is our midwife. And what God births will never lead to desolation. We are called to bear witness in the ruins, but rest assured, these birth pangs will end in joy. Amen. You may remain seated, but we will sing together what seems very appropriate, light dawns on a weary world. <laughs>
rise. As we, with the whole church, confess our faith in the words found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come into our time of prayer, I would again request prayers for Norma Peters, prayers for Sandy Cunningham as we mourn the loss of Fritz, and as we had a baptism last night, prayers for Sullivan and his family as he received his second birth in the waters of our font. Eternal God, you hold firm among the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. God, our creator, you show us the path of life. Bless faithful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm, even in religious spaces. Cultivate healthy congregations that tell of and enact your reconciling love. God, in your mercy. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, Protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them safely to a sheltered place and a more abundant season. God, in your mercy. God, our ruler, you write your law in human minds and hearts. Give wisdom to all leaders, elected and otherwise, and officials to govern with insight and compassion. Make them mindful of the well-being of all people so that your world will flourish. God, in your mercy. God, our stronghold, you are present amid disaster. We pray for those who are affected by natural disasters like earthquakes and famines, floods, hurricanes, wildfires. Give those first responders who support them courage, calm their fear, supply their need, be the solid ground beneath their feet. God, in your mercy. For those who work for peace, we give thanks. For our veterans who carry the scars of war, for all who serve to protect, We ask for for care and nurture. God, in your mercy. God, our guide, you are greater than we can imagine. Surround congregations with your expansive inclusion. Be present in the midst of disagreements, differences, questions. Unite people of diverse viewpoints in the love of Christ. God, in your mercy. And in keeping with God's commandment, we pray for others. We pray for those who celebrate their birthday this month. We pray for Rose and Evangeline. We pray for Greg and Hunter and Megan. We keep in our hearts Paul and Tim, Owen, Grace. We pray for Jacob, Amy, Cameron, We pray for the mission and ministry of Christ Lutheran Church in Spring Green. We hold close Norma and Sandy and Sullivan. And now in the hush of this space, we send our prayers unspoken but always heard to you.
God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You may be seated. It's time to take the morning offering. I invite you to rise. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way. May they know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people. 
for the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A feast of love is offered here for you and for all the saints. You may be seated. This morning we'll receive communion at the front. Myself and Bob will be there and you will receive first from me a wafer. You may take and eat right away. I always have a gluten-free alternative. If you need, simply tell me. And then Bob will hand you a cup. There is dark wine or lighter colored juice. Simply indicate which you would prefer. And then at either end, as you return to your seats, there is a basket for the used cups. Come, all is ready.
I invite you to rise. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Blessed Jesus, at this table, you have been for us both host and meal. Now send us forth to extend our tables to share your gifts until that day when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. God, the beginning and the end, who has written your name in the book of life, bless you and keep you in grace and peace from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. A reminder, our annual meeting will begin following the closing hymn and dismissal. And if you would like some baked beans or coleslaw, there are some left over from the funeral Friday, and we'd love you to take them. (laughs) Our closing hymn is number 848, Give to Our Immortal Praise. Led on by the saints before us, go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.